Hello, I'm Ian McDermott, founder of International Teaching Seminars. And I'm Patricia Riddle, Professor of Applied Neuroscience. We've come together because we're just fascinated in how we can apply neuroscience and give it to people so that they can use it. To that end, this is a, a brief introduction to one of the very obvious ways in which practical tools could be of real use. That is to say, how you can enhance remembering things, remembering better, making it stick. So, Yeah, so some people are blessed with good memory and others feel that they have to really try hard to make sure that they remember inf new information. And so what we want to do here is to give you five top tips of how you might be able to improve your own memory and be able to access information that you've, you've learned in the future. Yeah, now obviously this is just a, a very brief uh, account, so we don't have the, the luxury of giving you exercises and demonstrations, but we can at least give you some information. So let's begin. Okay, so point number one is to believe that you can remember. Kind of important, because how you think about what is possible strangely enough, affects what is possible. Yeah. So what does neuroscience tell us about people's ability to, to remember new information? Um, and this takes us into the realms of neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain to change. And what we are here to be able to tell you is that your brain changes throughout your lifespan, whether you choose to let it or not. So it's not something yeah. that you need to work on. So this is a, a capability that every human brain has from the moment of birth to death. It's not that, well, you missed the best years, sorry about that. This is something that is always possible. And therefore, if you want to improve performance in any area, if you know how you can, so let's focus on memory. Believing that you can remember is a bit like believing that you can build the muscle in your arm through exercise. It won't happen just automatically but if you put in enough information and do this in the right way, then you will be able to remember and remember better than you currently do. Because think of it the other way around. Suppose you don't believe you can remember. You're going to engage in various behaviours that demonstrate how right you are. <laughs> you know, you'll not do what it takes to actively encourage remembering. And you'll conclusively demonstrate that, yep, I knew, I knew this wasn't possible. So this gets to be kind of important. It's not happy clappy, yes, I'm a wonderful person and just tell myself this every morning. Yes, I can remember, but why don't I know everything that I've ever seen and heard and remembered immediately? You've got to do something. So let's think mm -hmm. of some other things that we can do. So the first thing that we would like to talk about is learning states. And it, it might be... Um, easy to think that well you just when you're learning you're only in one state you're in the state for learning but actually learning is so important in the brain that there are many states in which we learn and so it's great because you can actually choose which one to learn in. you can mix and match them and you can make like learning much more exciting as a result well yeah and so you know if i was to say to you um well what state do you like to be in in order to learn as a prerequisite for making sure you can learn most effectively. Most people just don't have any idea. Mm. But if think back, I, I know that if I think back to when I was at school, mm. I wasn't at my most learning able because I wasn't, for instance, I just wasn't that curious given the way things were being presented. Yeah. If you're not curious, do you really think you're going to learn? Curiosity is so important. And the lovely thing about curiosity is that when you become curious about something, it activates the, the dopamine reward centers. So you get a blast of reward for being curious. And that helps to keep us motivated to learn. Now, that's just one. So what else? How energized are you when you learn? Uh, you know, if you're kind of bored and <sighs> hoping it's going to be over soon, <laughs> Really? Is this going to help you remember things? Yeah. It'll remember how bored you were. That's what you'll remember. Yes, indeed. I mean, you can uh, probably have experiences of sitting over a book and your eyes just slowly closing. So not a great state for learning. It's about getting up. It's about maybe taking a piece of information, you know, do it on an exercise bike. Mm. Be, be active when you're learning. What makes you alert, aroused, excited? That's going to be something that you might want to consider helping you not only to learn, but ultimately to remember, because mm. this is the learning state. And I love healthy concern as a learning state. Now, I don't mean panic or, or overwhelm. I mean, oh my goodness, there's so much more to that I 
could learn here that oh my god I, I thought I understood this and now suddenly the ground has moved away mm -hmm. and that lovely sense of confusion just before you get it that that is um, activating your stress hormones to a small extent and we know that activating stress horns, hormones actually improves your ability to think so you're, you're actually rising up the curve that allows you to think better. Because your brain is paying attention because mm. there's something here. I need to really get it. Yeah. Now, in the same way, you could, you could activate more of a learning potentiality just by having the confidence that comes from knowing I, I can learn. Mm. And furthermore, I'm kind of interested in this anyway. Yeah. So if you're both enthusiastic and confident, wow. Yeah, and you know, gaining confidence is about testing yourself and finding that you can. So it's those easy wins. Put the books aside, do a quick sort of how much do I know, get somebody else to test you and celebrate the fact that you've actually learned because that will help embed the, mem the memory, that, the, the information that you're trying to learn. And the dopamine. And the dopamine, absolutely. <laughs> it all comes back to dopamine. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's not just that you've got to be, you know, climbing the, up the walls and oh so animated. Because equally, there's a kind of learning where you're at ease, you can reflect on things and from a calm place, mm. integrate what you have been absorbing. Kind of important. Yeah, and there's that, that space that you can give yourself where you've taken in something new and it's making connections. It's almost like it's got little tendrils going out. Well, what can I connect that to? What have I known already that this fits into? And that helps you to consolidate information and, and make it part of your knowledge not just knowledge so here are you know four examples and if you take those four examples do you know how to do that have you actively ever prepared before learning to get yourself in the right state we can do this so what else have we got at our disposal well Interestingly, the part of the brain that stores memories, the hippocampus, sits right next to the part of the brain that is um, our centre of emotion, or one of the centres of emotion, which is the amygdala. And that effectively gives you two sorts of memory. Mm. You know, memory for things that repeat and memories for things that are emotional. So... You might want to have a lot of emotion invested in what you're doing when you're learning. What happens then? It intensifies the experience. And I think if you reflect back on something that you remember, maybe a lesson that you learned at school, then often there's been a lot of emotion involved in it. It might have been um, a large canoe and the canoe tipped over and that was panic, or it might be um, we had so much fun, we were laughing so hard the day that we learned something else. So different emotional states will all benefit your ability to remember information. But of course the flip side is also true. Remember those days when it was kind of just pretty blah? <laughs> not enough emotional experience, not enough emotional dynamism. So there's not a lot to hook the new learning onto. But we can do this. We can actually have states of our choosing and you don't necessarily have to only learn through bungee jumping, you know. <laughs> but these things, you definitely remember them. Hmm? So what else do we have? Um, what happens, uh, the, the other side of remembering is forgetting. So if you imagine learning something for the first time, then initially you'll have quite a strong memory, mm -hmm. but over time that memory just okay. dis disappears. When do you try and recall the memory? If you wait too long, then effectively you're trying to remember again from scratch. There's <laughs> so nothing there. There's nothing there. So and it's you, kind of frustrating. I, do, I, I used to know this. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're almost you know, having to put in as much work the second time as you did the first. Mm -hmm. And this is where spaced learning becomes really important. Because if you can um, reactivate the memory as it's going, as it's losing strength, and do that on several iterations, the memory will become incredibly strong. So how would you do that? And by the way, it doesn't have to be, I must read exactly the same chapter in a book again. Yeah. You might activate this understanding by coming at it from a different angle. Absolutely. And in some ways that's even more stimulating mm. because now you're building more of a, a lattice work of memory, if you will. 
Absolutely. So space learning, not spaced out learning, but space learning, <laughs> is that something that you actively do? Is that something you've ever thought about? Did anybody tell you to do that? How to do it? And so, last one, the self-referencing effect. I, I love this because it's so easy. We remember better when it's about ourselves. Now this may, yeah, I mean, it may sound shockingly <laughs> egocentric, but there you go. You know, if you wanted to remember something, put yourself in it, because brain definitely pays more attention if you're involved, and it's because it's what? Your brain. Absolutely. So our autobiographical memory, memories are stronger. So imagine that you've got a piece of uh, information, a, a topic that you're trying to learn. How can you make it completely relevant to something that you're currently doing? How can you, you, you get the eye into that particular piece of learning so that, that it becomes something that is about you uh, in, in a real, real way? Now, I think there are lots of ways you can do that. You know, you may tell yourself a story about why this is important for you to know about or what you're going to do with it or how it becomes part of a repertoire that adds to your own sense of your accomplishments. There could be lots of ways. Yeah. It doesn't have to just be it occurred on a Wednesday and I was having you know, my, my supper at the time. There are lots of ways of referring back to you. And the more you do that, the more easily you'll find that you recall the memories at a later date. So it's yeah. a really great, really easy tip to get better memory. So we've given you five different um, techniques or tips that we can use for memory. And you could say, you know, that here, here's a, a way of well, blessing yourself because here's a handy acronym. <laughs> you want to rattle this off? We've talked about believing that you can remember. We've talked about learning states. We've talked about adding emotion when you're learning. We've talked about spacing the learning so that you recall things before you forget them. And we've talked about the self-referencing effect. And we could take any one of these and give you a whole bunch of experience, data, applications but in terms of a, a quick overview, these are things that are worth knowing about. They've worked very well researched and equally important, this is not the sum total of what we know about you know, enhancing <laughs> like memory. Burn. No. And no. so, uh, indeed, we could say if you, if you implement these tips, you'll be blessed. But we blessed with what? With better memory. But notice there's an ED on the end there. <laughs> and that actually is a bit of a tease because, yes, we've given you five tips here. Each one of those will take a little while to implement. If you really start to think about how am I going to do that, there are certainly a couple more, which we cover on the programme. And in a way, all of this is down ultimately to what can you do with this kind of information, not only for you, but for other people as well. That's you know, right. So you could take any of these. Imagine, for instance, how would these apply if you were uh, leading a team? You know, how would you, these apply if you're a parent whose child has a, a, an A-level to mm. study for? Mm. What states do you want your team to be in so that they can learn what they need to learn in order to achieve maximum effectiveness and improvements in performance? That's something which any leader needs to be thinking about. Absolutely. Most leaders don't, because most leaders aren't aware that this matters and they don't have that understanding of the brain that would give it due importance. Mm. So you could take any of these and begin to think about... How does that apply in a huge variety of contexts? But for us, that's why the program really matters. It gives us the time to move into this kind of learning. And if you're interested, then we're probably going to be meeting uh, in the not too distant future because what we found is that when people have the tools, they go out and immediately apply them. Absolutely. We even have people doing projects and they come back and tell us they've done things, which frankly are innovations, and we find them really interesting. That's, you know, that's fascinating. We're advancing the field, basically. Absolutely, yes. And we, and, yeah, we invite you to come yeah. along and be part of that. No, we look forward to advancing the field with you. <laughs>